to something that doesn't quite make sense to the systems that we live in. So I bring us back to the Narnia conversation. Let's hear it again. Susan asks Mrs. Rabbit slash Beaver, is he quite safe? I should feel very nervous about meeting a lion. Mrs. Beaver says, if there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, then they're either braver than most or just plain silly. Mm -hmm. And Lucy says, so then he isn't safe. Mr. Beaver, safe. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. The end. You want to hold that today? Yeah. Let me say a prayer for us. God, help us to know that you are with us and you are good, no matter the challenges that come and the risks that we are called to take for the sake of love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Good morning, church. Benjamin and Lucas and I come to you fresh from our Sierra Pacific Synod Assembly last weekend in Burlingame, California. This is that gathering of delegates from churches in our synod, and we're a large synod. We cover a lot of California and a lot of Nevada. And so with all these people from diverse places, we were surrounding this theme of newness and life. And I can tell you, Fresh from that meeting, sometimes, or many times, it takes gathering in community to encounter, like to encounter a surprise again, where you might say, ah, new life, ah, testimonies and stories, ah, God's renewing spirit is working with us. And so I bring you greetings from that wider church assembly where we elected a new bishop, the Reverend Jeff Johnson, to serve a six-year term. And we come home with hints and maybe the glow or the after effects of worshiping with 500 Lutherans from the West we were worshiping and voting and making art and encouraging each other. I hope you'll consider being a delegate to the assembly next June. If so, you get to go visit lovely Fresno, California. <laughs> I see that hand. But as I've been saying, God's new life will meet us there. It will be good. In the story of Jonah that we read just a piece of today, New life is gifted to a people. It's a people Jonah actually despises. He eventually goes and preaches to the Ninevites, but he doesn't want to. He wants God's wrath to be given to the people. And when these enemies end up receiving the generosity of God, which is God receiving them and hearing their repentant hearts, well, this is terrible enough news for Jonah. He wants to die. Oh, God of new life, I didn't know you were going to give it to people I didn't want you to give it to. And now I don't know about my own life anymore. <laughs> like, my life is in danger because of your life-giving ways, oh God. Jonah is an extreme story. But it's so true to the way we work as humans. And so is the parable Jesus tells in Matthew's gospel. This landowner keeps hiring workers throughout the day. And they put in different lengths of time. And at the day's end, even the workers who were brought on late in the day receive the full day's wage, just as the ones who began their work at the beginning and through the heat of the day. And true to the way we work, the workers who showed up early in the day grumble that the landowner is showing extravagance. For Jonah, he sees himself as an early in the day worker, of course, right? Probably like you and me. 
God, I've been with you working at this. I know what it takes. I've been responsible, so I know you're giving me what is due for me. But also, let's not get all loosey-goosey with the latecomers, okay? Keep it tight. Jonah and the the early-in-the-day workers, and you and I, we want to dictate how all this might go down because we're in rhythms and ways of thinking that say, There's only going to be so much. This well is going to run dry. We think and act as if at the end of all this, there's only so much grace. Like Jonah, he was saved in the belly of a whale. And now he's walking the streets and he's seeing the grace of God in front of him. And he's still saying, something stinks. Well, it's you, Jonah. (laughs) Jonah, hear the heart of grace. It's proclaimed in Psalm 145, a goodness that is beyond us. This is a refrain we say often in our religious tradition, but do we believe it? Do we expect it? The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. This means when it comes to steadfast love, God is swimming in it. It is abounding. God's got too much of it, too much love, at least the way we see it. which is what I titled today's sermon. It's from a song by one of my favorites, Sufjan Stevens. In a song called Too Much, he says, there's too much writing on that, too much love. And imagery that this brings up is maybe like placing a bet where you and I might see the stakes of a situation And you look at it and you say, there's too much money in the pot right now. If I go in here, I'm overcommitted and I can't risk it. There's too much riding on that. Except with Sufyan, he's talking about love and the risk of love. And in today's scriptures, we are witnesses to steadfast love. Love that does not keep score. Love that is not engaged with us because it's a transactional relationship. Love that is abounding and scandalous and dangerous and in our weak moments, it's a bit too much. It's love in a new paradigm that calls us out of our calculating systems And into the kingdom of God, or another name for it that fits for today, the economy of God. Matthew tells us, Jesus is teaching the disciples, the kingdom of heaven is like this surprising gift from a landowner. Weighty, scary, extravagant as it may be. Is the kingdom of heaven safe? Who said anything about being safe? Of course it isn't safe, but it's good. It's good. This event where a landowner has enough, enough to be offensively generous and willing to keep finding workers. The landowner visits that marketplace over and over throughout the day, finding more people and calling them over and then giving them the full day's wage. This cannot be a safe business practice, but it can be what the kingdom of heaven is like. Well, Lord knows these are difficult values for you and I to embody. We're not acting like it's easy. This is challenging for pride, for our work ethic, and for our fear of a slippery slope, if we're going to let people join the work like this, if we're going to pay people like this, seems unsustainable. And so I appreciate this prayer from St. Ignatius of Loyola. Maybe you know it. 
One of his famous prayers is, teach us, good Lord, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for reward, except that of knowing that we are doing your will. Teach us to serve, to give, and not to count the cost. Ignatius, I wonder, how are we doing with all this? How do you think we're doing with all this? People of the way of Christ, people of the cross, which is what all of this is an invitation to. Do we give and toil and labor without counting the cost? No. No, try as we might, and honestly, I'm not sure I try even all that hard. But try as we might, I'm not sure we could do it. But maybe with the Spirit's help, we could try. Yeah, what if we practiced at it? Beginning to ride a bike or tiptoeing onto the diving board. Practicing abounding in grace. See, one of the respites we have in this difficulty of releasing our pride and feeling the freedom of the other side, it's something that neither Jonah nor the workers in the vineyard seem to have embraced. It is that we have each other. Existing in or living the kingdom of God isn't something we do alone. Philippians reminds us today, strive side by side together in this wild economy of God, holding the bicycle for each other. And so we have outreach ministries in the room today to share with you. We are inviting you to practice the good news with your hands and your feet and your heart and your energy because it's by grace that we can give with joy when we do it together. Or like when we do God's work our hands and we take an hour and we make care kits to give out to needy people on the streets. There is something particular and joyful and easier when we do it together. It's like our ego gets lost and somehow we're encouraging each other not to count the cost. Which I hope we learn because at the church We don't pay you all fairly. Eileen Way gives so much time and energy to this place for free. Jean Carter comes in and keeps stocking the kitchen. Betty Thompson comes up during the week just to do whatever is to be done. Sharon Scaliotti this week was here more days than she was not here, and it's not like she lives around the corner. Eric keeps ticking things off the property to-do list from trenches, concrete, to parking lot lights. And friends, I'm sorry, I, I don't have a just reward for all of that today. I just know that when I pay attention, I notice the good news. It is that there is enough. There is enough. God provides for us for each day. And we can let go into the steadfast love, into abounding compassion. There is enough. God, wake us up with trust today, with joy and hope and delight in that promise. It may not shout. Sometimes it might just whisper. It might arrive simply like bread and wine. But they are a promise of abounding steadfast love that gives us faith and makes us new. Even when there's too much, for us it is enough. Amen.